This video is the first in a series of three about reproductive histology and physiology, and one of two that focuses on the structural and functional features of the female reproductive system. The female reproductive system consists of a series of organs that function together to produce and nourish viable offspring. The ovaries, uterine tubes, uterus, and vagina comprise this system. While the mammary glands are important for the nourishment of offspring but are not considered reproductive organs per se, this two part series will discuss the structure and function of each of these organs, including the ovarian cycle and hormonal regulation. These organs function to produce the female gametes, provide an environment for fertilization, and hold the embryo until birth. They also produce steroidal sex hormones. This video will discuss the ovaries. The paired ovaries are the primary female reproductive organ, which functions to produce female gametes or oocytes or ova. They also produce the female sex hormones estrogen and progesterone. The paired ovaries are located in the pelvic cavity on either side of the uterus held in place by the broad ligament. Seen here is an H&E stained section of an ovary, which is organized into two regions, an outer cortex that contains thousands of follicles embedded in connective tissue stroma, and an inner medulla that consists of loose connective tissue, blood, lymphatic vessels, and nerves. Each ovary is surrounded by a dense connective tissue capsule, the tunica albuginea, that is covered with a simple cuboidal epithelium called the germinal epithelium. The follicle is the structural and functional unit of the ovary and each follicle consists of a single oocyte surrounded by one or more layers of follicular or granulosa cells which produce the sex hormones. Each ovarian cortex contains follicles in different stages of maturation that mature in response to estrogen and follicle stimulating hormone from the anterior pituitary. This entire developmental process takes approximately three months. These granulosa cells secrete primarily estrogen, which controls proliferation of the cells, helps with maturation of follicles, and is critical for the monthly development of the uterine endometrium, as we'll discuss in the next video. Oocytes are formed by a process called oogenesis, which begins prenatally and is not completed until fertilization. In the female, the primordial germ cells arrest in prophase of meiosis I, around four to five months of gestation, and remain arrested until puberty. Each of these dormant oocytes is enclosed in a layer of flattened follicle cells surrounded by a basal lamina. These primordial follicles, formed prenatally, are the only follicles present in the ovary until puberty. Unlike spermatozoa that are continuously produced, all oocytes are generated prenatally and these numbers decline continuously. Maturation of the oocytes occurs cyclically and usually only one mature oocyte is released. Remarkably, only around 0.1% of these primordial follicles will mature and be released, and the rest will die by a process termed atresia. This begins prenatally and continues after menopause. Beginning at puberty, these follicles will begin growing and undergoing a pattern of histological and hormonal changes that we'll now describe. The ovary of a woman in her reproductive years contains follicles in all stages of maturation. First, the oocyte enlarges with each subsequent stage. At puberty, under the influence of follicle-stimulating hormone, the granulosa cells begin to proliferate. They become cuboidal and connected via gap junctions, as seen here in this unilaminar primary follicle. As the follicle continues to grow, the granulosa cells continue to proliferate so that the cuboidal epithelium becomes stratified. The oocyte and granulosa cells begin to secrete glycoproteins, which form a coat around the oocyte called the zona pellucida. The zona pellucida remains with the oocyte after ovulation, functioning to bind sperm and initiate the acrosome reaction. If fertilization occurs, the zygote will cleave within the zona pellucida and hatch from it only after entering the uterus. At the same time, the interstitial cells, or the connective tissue cells, adjacent to the basal lamina will differentiate into a bilayered structure called the theca folliculi, which will encapsulate the follicle, eventually forming several layers. Most follicles will now die before they reach the next stage, the secondary or antral follicle. The major change seen here is the formation of fluid, termed liquor folliculi, that accumulates in the intracellular spaces in the granulosa, forming a chamber called the antrum. At the start of each ovarian cycle, 5 to 12 antral follicles will be selected to continue to grow and mature. And at this stage, the theca folliculi has differentiated into two layers an inner layer or theca interna that secretes the androgen androstadione 
which granulosa cells will transform into estradiol via the enzyme aromatase, and the outer layer, the theca externa, which consists of fibroblasts and smooth muscle cells. Both of these layers are vascularized, unlike the granulosa layer, and you can note on the image on the right that the cells of the theca interna contain the characteristic lipid droplets of steroid hormone producing cells. As the antrum forms, the oocyte becomes surrounded by a layer of cells called the corona radiata, which will leave the ovary with the oocyte at ovulation. The oocyte becomes suspended into the antral cavity and is supported by a small mass of granulosa cells called the cumulus oophorus. At this point, one follicle out of the growing group of follicles will become dominant and continue to grow into mature into what we see here, a graphene or mature follicle. The remaining follicles will undergo atresia. The oocyte of the dominant follicle will resume meiosis and produce the secondary oocyte, which now contains half the chromosomes and almost all the cytoplasm. This oocyte soon initiates but arrests in the second meiotic division which will not now complete until fertilization. This diagram is for your review, summarizing the changing size and morphology of the follicular granulosa cells at each stage and the surrounding thecal cells. How exactly does one follicle become dominant? The mechanisms that control this process are not completely understood. We know that they are hormonally controlled. We know that the dominant follicle will produce more estrogen from thecal cells and we also know that it has more follicle stimulating hormone receptors on the granulosa cells. So it may be that this is why the follicle is able to survive a severe drop in follicle stimulating hormones while other follicles die. Think about what might happen if a dominant follicle fails to ovulate. The hormonal regulation of follicle maturation is complicated and it's not completely understood, but let's walk through the current model step by step. First, let's review the follicular phase, the stages of follicle development we've just described. The hypothalamus secretes gonadotropin-releasing hormone that stimulates the anterior pituitary to release follicle-stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. Follicle-stimulating hormone will stimulate the group of antral follicles to grow and produce estrogen, while luteinizing hormone will promote the theca interna to produce androgens, which follicular granulosa cells will convert to estrogen by aromatase. As the estrogen levels continue to rise, this still relatively low level will provide negative feedback to the hypothalamus and pituitary, which will inhibit follicle-stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. At the same time, the follicles secrete inhibin, which also further inhibits follicle-stimulating hormone production. Thus, only that dominant follicle will survive the dip in follicle-stimulating hormone, and that may do, be due to the increased numbers of follicle stimulating hormone receptors as we just discussed. Estrogen will also help the mature follicle to develop and that mature, here called a vesicular follicle, will produce large amount of estrogen called a threshold amount. Midway through the ovarian cycle, this estrogen level will reach a point where the negative feedback flips to positive feedback on the hypothalamus and anterior pituitary. And so as a consequence, there is a surge in luteinizing hormone that triggers the meiosis of the dominant oocyte followed by ovulation. Let's go over those ovulation events from the point of view of the oocyte and the follicle. The surge of luteinizing hormone has multiple effects on the follicle. First, the dominant oocyte undergoes the first meiotic division, arrests in metaphase two. At the same time, the granulosa cells are producing prostaglandins and hyaluronin that will loosen the cells and make the follicular fluid more viscous. The prostaglandins will stimulate smooth muscle contractions of the theca externa, while the ovarian wall becomes weakened by plasminogen. These events combine to cause the follicle to rupture and release the ovum with the corona radiata into the peritoneal cavity. So what happens to that empty follicle? The follicle becomes a temporary endocrine organ in the ovarian cortex called the corpus luteum. Secretions of the corpus luteum are essential for the initiation and maintenance of early pregnancy. The appearance of this organ depends upon the length of time after ovulation. First, the blood from the disrupted capillaries of the ovary and follicle will form a large clot or central clot which fills the follicle, now called the corpus hemorrhagicum. The corpus luteum will form 
as the granulosa and thecal cells reorganize and take on new endocrine functions under the control of luteinizing hormone. The granulose lutein cells now enlarge and secrete progesterone in addition to estrogen, but make more progesterone. While the smaller and darker thecal cells now invade the granulosa and become theca lutein cells that produce androgens but predominantly produce progesterone. Capillaries from the thecal cells will invade and vascularize the granulosa. Now the fate of the corpus luteum will depend upon whether pregnancy occurs. If there's no pregnancy, the corpus luteum degenerates. The cells stop producing steroids and the drop in progesterone leads to menstruation while the loss of estrogen negative feedback causes the follicle stimulating hormone levels to rise again, which will stimulate the growth of new follicles. Eventually, the remains are phagocytosed by macrophages, and fibroblasts will invade the area and produce a dense connective tissue scar called the corpus albicans. If pregnancy occurs, the corpus luteum will be maintained for several months by human chorionic gonadotropin from the trophoblast of the embryo, which will stimulate the continued secretion of progesterone which will maintain the uterine mucosal lining until the placenta is producing estrogen and progesterone at around four to five months, hence the term progestational hormone. Let's review the ovulation and luteal phases. Under the influence of luteinizing hormone, the corpus luteum forms. The corpus luteum will produce progesterone and estrogen that inhibit the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary, thus preventing the release of follicle-stimulating hormone. If a pregnancy does not occur, the corpus luteum will degenerate and the negative feedback regulation will be released, allowing the release of follicle-stimulating hormone and the cycle to begin again. Finally, it's worth repeating, but most follicles fail to mature and die via atresia. This process is a hormonally controlled apoptotic process that occurs from the primordial up through the antral state. The granulosa cells apoptose and autolyze the oocyte and macrophages will come in and clean up the debris. A female has around 300,000 oocytes at puberty since many are lost to atresia pre-puberty. But around 450 of these oocytes will leave the ovary during ovulatory events during a woman's reproductive life. Thus, in the postmenopausal ovary, there will be few follicles, most having died due to atresia. Those lost to ovulation will leave scars as shown here. Now that the oocyte has undergone ovulation, it will enter the oviduct and the rest of the reproductive tract. We will cover the rest of the reproductive organs in the next video.